A conservative estimate at auction would probably be about fifteen to twenty thousand dollars. Shut up. <laughs> now, with almost nine million viewers weekly, it's the most watched show on PBS. <laughs> so, Mom, so. did you hear that? <laughs> We're going to Acapulco for the weekend. <laughs> A new season of treasure hunting led Antiques Roadshow to New Orleans. We have an all access pass to all things Antiques Roadshow, where the past comes alive and treasures are uncovered. Be still my heart. Getting to go behind the scenes at Antiques Roadshow. Oh, oh wait, the camera's on? Oh my god. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't realize you guys were listening. Beep, beep. Oh, Molly's shaking her head like, here we go. Otherwise, it's the perfect piece. Thanks. Don't use this I mean, one. Yeah, don't. Backstage New Orleans made its <laughs> own discovery. It would be, be awesome. Like, it would be like, oh my god, it's like Bourbon Street in the convention. The camera crew is walking away in disgust right now. <laughs> For over 20 years, Antiques Roadshow has been part treasure hunt and part history lesson, and PBS's most watched reality show. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and if you don't believe me that Antiques Roadshow is a true reality show, ask the people that work on it, like Marsha Bemko, the show's executive producer, and line producer Jill Giles. This is smart reality television and your neighbors are the actors in here. Antique Short Show as a real, true reality show is, you know, we're not deciding on what's coming in ahead of time. It's really a discovery for all of us that day. A 19-year-old Jackie Robinson signature, I've never seen one that young. Wow. I just don't know what we're gonna see, so I can't even predict, and I wouldn't want to. What we're going to see backstage at the filming of the 15-time Emmy-nominated Antiques Roadshow is how this show turns a massive event into moments of revealing personal discovery. And on some occasions, discovering big money. So we comfortably believe that it is American. It's great condition, great subject matter. I would insure it probably between $40,000 and $50,000. Great, Scott. This is our 22nd season that we're filming, and every year we go to an average of about six cities uh, across the country, try to spread it out on the map. So we have some cities in the Northeast, the South, the West, and then we, from each of the locations that we go to, we make three hour long episodes. This season, New Orleans, Louisiana was on their radar. I think New Orleans was the crew favorite of the season. I think that's maybe kind of the highlight of the year. Although we like going to every city we go to, especially cities we've never been to. But I mean, New Orleans, I mean, you know, the music, the food, the culture, the architecture. I mean, I, a lot of people were really excited. And I know a lot of appraisers came early to take advantage of what there is to see here. Everybody I know that is staying a few days late or coming a few days early. I, I have to say, you know, because I was here last time, I've just noticed um, the, the feeling here is so positive. All of the cities are special that we visit, but I would say in New Orleans, I know we're gonna be eating and drinking really well. <laughs> but Louisiana offers more than just being one of the world's top tourist destinations. It offers family history. People have family histories all over, but my long-term personal association with Louisiana is they're, they're, they seem to be deeper and longer family associations. And yes, people have moved here from all over the world, but the people have roots here going back hundreds of years. Those roots are formed by the area's unique past. New Orleans being a port, as we know, people and objects have come into the port of New Orleans from all over the world for hundreds of years and, and created this rich melding of cultures and religions and races melding into a unique thing that exists no, nowhere else. That uniqueness is also formed by the city's recent past. I think you learn as much from something that's a survivor as you do something that's in pristine condition, sometimes even more so. One of the things that I've been doing is I've been asking, where were you and Katrina? How did it affect you? I imagine we will see things tomorrow that we hear the story that this survived Katrina. It's the only thing that survived Katrina. I, I can hear it already. Everybody here is a survivor. Let's find some objects that are survivors. And now it has this provenance that goes with it that now it's been through Katrina. And you know, that's, that's a story in itself as well. These personal stories are one of the reasons that viewers keep tuning in to Antiques Roadshow. But backstage, the first thing you discover about this show built around personal discoveries is that it's television production built on a grand scale. 
and that's why they needed to set up shop at the Moriel Convention Center on the city's riverfront. We have always done the show at a convention center and we need 80 to 100,000 square feet of space to greet 5,000 people tomorrow. What I think a lot of people don't realize is that it's a huge public event. Even though they may only see 15 items or 30 items on a particular episode, that um, we're seeing about 10,000 antiques each day that we have the event. And it's a free verbal appraisal for everybody who comes for each of their two items. And we make sure that we give everybody a good verbal appraisal who comes to the show. For the New Orleans event, that free appraisal and the chance to be part of this PBS mainstay drew over 11,000 applicants for those 5,000 tickets. A day before the family heirlooms and flea market finds take center stage, it takes a village to raise the big top on this road show. We come in with a crew of about 55. We'll hire about 15 local crew um, that will help us with the uh, cameras and uh, lighting and setup. We also have the team from the convention center that will help us set up tables and chairs and pipe and drape and that sort of thing. And then we have about 125 volunteers that we train uh, the day before to kind of be the face of Roadshow. And those are the people that most of the folks will see in their Antiques Roadshow shirt, you know, ushering, greeting, giving direction to folks. And then our 75 appraisers. So it's a, it's a pretty big operation. Craft services has got to be huge on this thing. Yes, it's really important. Food and where you sleep. <laughs> those two things are very important. Because the focus of the show is on the revealing one-on-one -on -one nature of the appraisals, the true enormity of this event is not apparent to the A&R fan. It's that personal tone, that very personal tone that I think makes Antiques Roadshow look quaint and small and family-like. Like it's happening in your living room, but it isn't. This is a huge operation. You know part of why it feels quaint and small and family-like is that you're sensing all of you how we all feel about each other. Um, we work with a group of about 150 experts assigning about 70 to each city. My staff and my crew are pretty much the same in every city. And we've known each other for a long time. There are people who've gotten married to each other here. There are people who have become real friends. Before doing Roadshow, if Christie's walked by Sotheby's down the street in New York, they wouldn't talk to each other. Now they do. Is it a circus family? Because this is like the big top of antiques. It's like a big circus family. We are like a big Roadshow family. That's the big secret behind the scenes here. It's summer camp for adults. <laughs> it is like a camp and a lot of these people we don't see all year long. And when we see each other over the summer, it's just like wonderful old friends. A lot of us have been doing the show together for 10 or 20 years. I've done it for 21 years. So we know each other's wives, we know their children, we, 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 know, we know their ex-wife. You know, it's, it's a long history. Uh, so it's not only just professional, but it, it becomes a friendship. There is another little known fact about Antiques Roadshow. We put the public in public television. We really, really do. We have an enormous amount of volunteerism here making this show happen. The majority of people working the show tomorrow are unpaid. With the exception of the television crew from WGBH in Boston, which produces the show, and the 15 or so local camera people they hire, everybody working is doing it for free. Everybody the public television station in this market. YES gave us 125 volunteers who are going to work tomorrow for the, we're going to pay them with lunch, breakfast, and an appraisal. That's volunteering, thank you. Thank God we didn't have to pay them. And our experts who will work as volunteers tomorrow, who flew themselves here at their own expense, who are paying their own hotel nights, even the true co-stars of the show, the appraisers, are doing it for no pay. I don't know if everybody knows that we donate our time. I'm not sure, but um, it, it's nice for them to know that we do, we do donate our time. That's true. We're all volunteers, so we pay our own way as far as travel expenses and hotels. They're on their own. They pay their own way. We're going to give them breakfast and lunch, <laughs> two meals, and, um, and we've changed their lives. I think Everybody knows Antiques Roadshow and it's very prestigious 
and I think it's, you know, it's an honor to be an appraiser on the show. What they get out of it is that they have um, the credibility of being associated with Antiques Roadshow, the national exposure when they are shown on television. I can't lie, it, it certainly is, it is nice publicity for the, for the gallery. But there is something more than just a PR boost that keeps these experts on the road with the Roadshow year after year. Why do it? You're a business owner, you're a successful appraiser. Why do you come out and spend your summers? I love it. <laughs> I just love it. I can't explain it, but you know, I make all of my plans for the summer based on what I'm going to do for Antiques Roadshow. We get a lot out of it. We, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun to do, and it's a lot of fun to, to meet all the people who come to the show and hear their stories and talk about their objects. Everywhere you go, you see things that you don't see someplace else. Even though I'm an appraiser and I'm an antique specialist, there are other things to learn in life, and because I've appraised on Antiques Roadshow, I have those opportunities. And obviously over years, you know, even though we all know a lot, we learn a lot because you can't help from, from people bring things in and tell you stories. You keep learning, you keep seeing things you haven't seen. So it's a constant learning process. Could you do this show without the volunteers? There is no way we could do the show without the volunteers. They really are the face of the road show. They deserve an enormous amount of credit because if we had to pay our experts or pay the 125 volunteers who are gonna to work tomorrow, I wouldn't be sitting here in this chair. You couldn't do the show without it? No, we don't have the budget, you don't have the financing to do that. As we soon discovered, most folks attending Antiques Roadshow didn't see major increases in their finances either. I'm Steve. And I'm Courtney, and we're from New Orleans, Louisiana. And, and this is our 1950s Matador lamp. Matador lady lamp, actually. We got it at a junk shop, paid about 30 bucks for it, found out it was worth 85, so. It's a female matador? It is. What do you call That's a female matador? Matadam. The matadam. This is part of the new feminist movement. <laughs> Lady matadors. It's gonna be a new thing in I'm Spain. I'm never getting rid of it. <laughs> no, don't ever sell that. No, no. I let him keep it around because when you turn it on, it's sexy. <laughs> Wow, my mom is going to freak out. Before it's lights, camera, appraisal, there's a few lines to get through. The folks that come to the show, to the event, will bring two items. They'll, they'll queue up in our reception area. Think Disney World for antiques aficionados. But you don't know what ride you're on until you get to the end of the line. People say that the, one of the best things about the event to them is meeting other people in line and sharing their stories and making friends with the other folks that they meet on the way to the event. Then they get to an area that's called triage. Good morning, sir. How are you? Come on Denver. over. Where they basically have like an initial assessment of what they brought. So I snapped right them off. So you got a bargain. <laughs> I got a second bargain. Okay, you have a silver teapot. You get a ticket for silver. Then you brought in a book. And here's your ticket for your book and then you're escorted onto the lines on the set. It's on the set that things get real. And for the first time, things look like what you see on your TV. What did you pay for? It was in the garage when I bought the house. So it was on the set, we have about 23 different categories of items. Um, and an experts in each of those categories. And then they get a free verbal appraisal for each of their items. Signed and dated lower right. It's on the set where assumption meets assessment, where vintage meets video, and where prized possessions meet the pitch. When I see something that I think is a good, something that's good to pitch, um, I might ask a few very basic questions, but nothing that I'm going to actually ask on camera, just some background information. We want the element of surprise when we're on TV. If what they have is something really spectacular, then they're um, asked to wait for a producer where they can, uh, the appraisers can pitch the item for television. I mean, it's the New Orleans connection, obviously. I know, I just feel like he's here to get on TV because there's no other reason for him to be here. If he wanted to get a value for it, he should call his dad and say, what's this thing worth now? You know? So, no. All right, I got it. <laughs> they're gonna pitch like mad bunnies to tell you why this vase, this painting, whatever it is, is the best you've ever seen. And they're good salesmen. And everybody had to have a box amplifier because that's what all the Beatles use because it's exclusive contract. Oh. So this is an actual easel back countertop display that would have been in the music store. I think one of the hardest things about picking something for tape is that you want to say yes to everything pretty much. You just can't. 
there's not enough camera time for it. Well, yeah. it's the Beatles, obviously. It's them when they very, very young, maybe even before they came over from England. So I was yeah. stumped by it. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right, let me go talk to Grant. Not everybody wants to be on TV, but most of them do. Most of them don't have tape-worthy objects or a story around their okay. object. Thank you so much. We say no a lot more than we say yes. Yeah, hey, no problem. Grant's going to give you an appraisal on right okay. now. Thanks Thank so you. much. Yeah. Yep. Backstage, you can sense the transformation as the appraiser becomes a sales rep, but they never go full Glen Gary, Glen Ross. But our experts most have been with us a long, long time, and they don't frivolously pitch. There are a number of different reasons why I, I pitch something. Sometimes it's great because they have no idea what it is. Sometimes um, well, they have no idea what the value is. Is this your first stop? Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. They stopped at this. Here is lovely lady, uh, goddess Buddha. Okay. She goes like that. And this is some information that my father wrote down. What, what did he do? He was um, the prefecture commander in Himeji, Japan. Really? After the war. And wow. he was in, I guess you would call it counterintelligence. Cool. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when I pitch something for TV and someone says, oh, it's this, and, and, I, and I said, oh, really? OK, great. And I know it's exactly something else. And that opens a door to impart the information. How old do you think it is? I don't know. Okay. I, I mean, but I... I uh, sometimes the guest is so interesting <laughs> that I've actually, I have to admit, I actually pitched the guest once. And um, I think that when the producer came over and met her, she was just so uh, magnetic and, and delightful. And, and, and they said, yes, we're definitely going on camera with her. To tape or not to tape? That is the question that can only be answered by the producers. I'm going to go talk to Jim. Let me have the tablets and the... I would first talk with the expert, learn what he will learn. The 6th century one? Uh, it's like 500s. 500s. And what dynasty? Way. Way. Yeah. Then interview the guest. Like, you know, where did you get it? What do you know about it? You know, we want to make sure we're not putting on people who are just there for kind of show and tell and then kind of make a decision on, is this something that we haven't seen before that would be interesting to our viewers? And between those two interviews, you decide whether or not to, to tape something. Well, Rudy, nice job bringing your mom today. She's going to go on TV with her items. Oh, wow. <laughs> what a nice daughter oh. she is. <laughs> My daughter! So you're going to talk about it because they belong to you, but we okay. thank her for bringing you. Okay. Everybody coming tomorrow won't get taped. Even if you're taped, you may not make it to air. I could cut it. What are the odds that someone is going to be on TV? All right, Tom, I was told there would be no math here today. <laughs> no. uh, I would say if there's 10,000 items, we're filming about 200 for television, so the odds are not in your favor that you're going to make it to TV. Really? No way. The odds of making it on air on your local PBS station is somewhere between being audited by the IRS and dating a millionaire. And don't expect to meet that millionaire here. The odds of striking it rich on Antiques Roadshow is about 60,000 to one. Ah, uh, you're kidding me. That's the big backstage secret of this show. Fame and fortune are not the reason those 5,000 people attended this event in New Orleans. For most, it's about the valued memories that each treasure has kept alive. I brought my grandfather's walking sticks that he used to use when he walked across the fields to court my grandmother. They're all together worth maybe $250, but priceless because without this piece of history, where would we be? People who are coming here tomorrow are coming with the two most precious things in their home other than their family members very often. It's a mid-century throne. It is indeed. Or a Pee Wee Herman chair. It always reminds me of Pee Wee Herman. It's a Pee Wee Herman. Um, I feel like it should start talking to me, right? If they start talking right. to you, yeah, let, let us know. Right. And usually those two objects are not extremely valuable. Statistically, they just aren't. We, most of us don't own things like that. And the monetary value is interesting, and that's certainly part of the story, but actually so many things the, the family story is so good and the love or the attraction to the object that the owner has that sometimes the value is just so secondary. 
like the family story of New Orleans resident Emily Cosper. Well, these were my grandmother's chairs, and I learned that they were made by Adrian Pearsall in the early 60s, which I knew because her house was a mid-century modern house. So all of the furniture, every piece of furniture was like this. And when she passed away, I inherited them. Did you learn anything about your grandmother with these? Oh, my grandmother's crazy. Um, she was a real eccentric uh, in town, and when we first brought them home, my grandmother was fastidious and keeping her house clean, and we never sat on them. And we brought all this furniture home. First, second, I had them in the house. Cat climbed up the back. There were never any animals in her house. The chair went kathonk, and all I could think was, oh, my grandmother, she would kill me. She would kill me if she knew the dog was sitting in those chairs. Um, and Grandma might not be happy about what happened next. You want to sit in one? Oh. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure my all-access pass included sitting on appraised furniture, but you have to try. Aren't they great? It's a good place to have a cocktail. I'm martini, the king of the cocktails over here. Martini, right? So many of the people who come into the show, they don't care what something is worth. They just want to, they want to share the history it's with really you. It's really quite lovely. I should be wearing a dickie and a sweater there, right? <laughs> Totally. Well, anyway, no matter what. We should be listening to some uh, jazz. Absolutely. We do. Sometimes you think, oh, they're just, they just want to know what it's worth. And people say, don't tell me about the value. Just tell me what it is. Tell me when it was made, how it was made, if you know. and. Uh, Maybe tell me if the story that my family has handed down for the past, you know, 100 years is accurate. The, the fact is, is we are seeing people who, most of them, know that they have something good. They just don't know how good. Well, we all know who that is. Right. Mr. Nixon! Richard Nixon, you're right. Tricky, tricky, tricky dicky. But on the other hand, sometimes people come in with these wonderful family stories, but always what I have to do is I have to look at the object and see if the object fits the story, and sometimes it doesn't. You know, if, if this story goes back to 1867 when so-and-so got married, and this factory didn't start until 1895, then they did not get it in 1867, and I have to be honest with that. They're very sensitive to breaking the news, especially when somebody believes it's and been told that it's of something of extreme value, and, it, and it's not. I want them to walk away with history and stories and families and, and all that. I don't really like them to walk away with just the value. For many, the worth of the item comes from its intrinsic value. We bought our amazing stained glass burger tree. They said it was worth about $500 or $600, but to us, it's priceless. And we have Spaceport USA punch-out book, not punched out, and it's worth about $20. And the real question is, how do you have a punch-out book that no kid ever got a hold of? That is a good question. I'm not sure, Mom. And I don't know how it got, maybe it got taken away from my brother, you know, <laughs> for a punishment maybe, you know, because and then my dad he forgot about it. He was that kind of kid? It. Oh, yeah. He was. He was bad. And sometimes the item's story is less about the item and more about how it got to Antiques Roadshow. Where do you find a foghorn? Well, my buddy is a you know ex-commercial diver like myself. I don't know where he got this from. <laughs> I, we were over there drinking beer one day and it was we all told, dusty. <laughs> yeah, we told him we we're gonna go to this, and he's like, "You want to take the horn?" I'm like, yeah. So this decision to come here was beer driven. <laughs> well, well like, it was beer driven it to is bring Lu this. <laughs> it is Louisiana, by the way. <laughs> P.S. <laughs> that is insane. What would you rather have, a undiscovered treasure? or an unbelievable personal relationship to that object? Oh. Both? Can I have an undiscovered? You can't have both. <laughs> you need to pick. Would you rather have a undiscovered treasure or an unbelievable story? Oh, that's a really great question. Undiscovered treasure, unbelievable story. You can only have one. I can only have one? That's like Sophie's choice. That's really hard. <laughs> Definitely the story. Definitely the story is what drives the show. Um, the objects tell the stories, so it's really an object-driven show, I believe. If I could have wishes come true, I'd want to find a missing masterpiece that has been missing for centuries, and it walked into Roadshow. 
with a family story behind it. Yeah, where the heck did they get that and where have they been hiding that missing masterpiece all these years? Sometimes it, you get both of those at the same time. That, that's the dream appraisal, to get both of those at the same time. Will a dream appraisal appear in the Crescent City? The only way to know is to watch. And America does love to watch. It's the viewers, like you, that have made Antiques Roadshow such a success. I think the reason the show for its longevity and popularity is we appeal to different people for different reasons. You also have people who just want to watch their neighbors have great thrills or great disappointments. And you will not watch a season of Roadshow and not learn when the Civil War happened. So I think people are, uh, appreciate the smartness, appreciate that they're learning something. They don't notice they're learning something because they're excited about what they're seeing. And um, I think that all combines up to about eight and a half million viewers a week. I think that people can relate to Antiques Roadshow because it's really about our collective material history. This is our show, America. This is our show. My goodness, I love this show. <laughs> In this American show, these items are more than canvas or glass. They're a connection between our collective past and present. And their true value is in the emotions they evoke and the memories they maintain. I'm Tom Gregory. Thanks for spending your precious time with us backstage. My name is Chris. Brought this painting in. My daughter didn't think I should bring it. She said maybe it might be worth a couple of few hundred. Found out it's worth 3,000. Pretty happy about that. Hi, my name is Becky. I'm from Minnesota, and I brought this picture of famous boxers. They were my uncle's two great uncles, Mike Gibbons and Tommy Gibbons. Even if this was worth a million bucks, it's going to stay in my house, and I'm going to cherish it. Stained glass hamburger tray. You don't eat hamburgers. We eat veggie burgers. Stained glass veggie burger tree. <laughs>